Well, thank you guys for braving the, uh, the parking lot situation out there, crossing the caution tape to get to church. I feel like there's a metaphor in there somewhere. Well, good morning, Evergreen. I'm, I'm Bob. I'm also one of the pastors and elders of our community. And as Amy said, last week we celebrated Easter, the resurrection of Jesus. The act by which God vindicated Jesus and, and put death on notice that it no longer was something to be feared. And guaranteed for us our resurrection. The new heavens and the new earth had begun. God was making all things new, putting all things back together again. And celebrating that, we also uh, had the great privilege of baptizing two members of our community, two people who stood up before us, before their families, before the whole world, really, and said, I want to follow Jesus. I want to be his disciple. I want to live my life as he would have me live it. Elizabeth and Jane. So that was exciting. We're glad to do that. This summer, uh, we are going to take a break from our normal mode of working through scripture verse by verse and doing book studies uh, and do some more topical things, focusing on some different areas of what a life of, of following Jesus looks like. And uh, I know this is rough first thing Sunday morning to start off with a question, uh, so I apologize. But it's a beautiful day. We should, we should all be a little bit warmed up. I want to ask uh, whether this comes out of your knowledge from having us gone through the, the book of Luke over the last year and a half or from other readings in the Gospels. What, what's the oddest thing that you can recall Jesus doing? Whether it's, like I say, from Luke or any of the other Gospels. What's, what's the thing that made you scratch your head the most? What do you think? The what? Oh, that was nice. Yes, he he, uh, he cured a blind man by basically spitting in the dirt and making mud and applying it to his eyes. Other times he just said, "Hey, be be a seeing person now." But this time he got tactile with it. Yes. Yeah. The yeah. times when he performed some kind of miracle, like healing a blind man or a lame person. Then he tells them, don't tell anybody. Yeah, yeah, we're going we're gonna to talk about that. Yeah, excellent. When he would do something, then he would say, shh. <laughs> what else? What surprised, what surprised you? What, what do you think was, is the most odd thing that maybe you can recall Jesus having done? I think his, well, the anger that he showed mm. when he came and, you know, overturned all those yeah. things. That, that, <clears throat> the anger he showed when he surprising to went me. into the temple and threw out all the, the money changers and people who were selling and doing things, which, yeah, it seemed, seemed very different than the character of Jesus all, all the way along. And also it's been a really good motivation for us to keep the amount of books we're selling on the back table to a bare minimum. <laughs> Just a, really. Yeah, Jerry. Uh, one thing I'll always remember is when his mother and brother came to see him. Oh, and yeah. Trying to get in. That was a good one. He just came to him and said, your mother and brother are here. And he was like, here are, here's my family. My here, 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 here are my here. mothers and brothers. Anyone who hears. Yeah, it's bring them in. It was, yeah. Nope, they're out. They're still outside. Yeah, yeah. Jesus uh, seemed to uh, often would treat his mother with, with tenderness and compassion, but on this point, just had to make a point, and mom uh, got thrown under the bus on that one. <laughs> Somebody over here had, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, the whole... Yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, didn't you know where to find me? Yeah, be in my father's house. That was an, always an odd one. And then, yeah, Stephen. Unless you eat of my flesh and drink my blood. Thank you. Yeah. You will have no part of it. Which, again, a metaphorical statement, but I love the fact that he doesn't, he doesn't lay out to them. Now, when I say eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, what I actually mean is this. He just drops this giant metaphor on them, blows their minds, and it's like he does a mic drop. He just walks away. And here comes our first train of the morning. 
Yeah, Scott, you want to pull that door closed, man. Yeah. And uh, all the children. Well, don't let them out. <laughs> Teresa of Avila, who is our patron saint for this year, said this. She said, you pay God a compliment by asking great things of him. So this morning as we sit quietly, as we, as we ponder, I want us to take a moment to pray. And I want you to consider the things that you've heard on the news this week, the things happening in our world, our country, our city, and in your life. And I want you to take a moment to bring them to God and pay Him the great compliment of asking great things of Him. So take a moment, just pray quietly to yourself, then I will lead us, we will sing, and we'll move on.
God, as we consider all the difficult things happening in our world, in our country, in our city, and in our lives, we ask you to intervene, to break in, to be present, to bring healing and wholeness in this world. God, on Easter Sunday, you began the process of making all things new. It's something that you continue today and will someday bring to a full and total culmination. God, we long for that day when your kingdom will come in its fullness. We say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Lord, as we open your word today, and we open our ears and our hearts to what you are saying to us. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, when it seems of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when found in the desert place, though I walk through the
go outside. Praise the God who let the stars out in the sky. Gather around with those who love and sing.
So at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, he shows up in his hometown in a, in a synagogue in Nazareth. And he volunteers to read the scripture for the day. So they pass him the scroll of Isaiah, and he, he turns to the part that he wants to read, and he stands up and he reads this. So if you have a Bible, look at Luke 4, 18. If not, the words will be up here on the screen. He stands up and he reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of Yahweh, our God, is upon me. For he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll, he handed it back to the attendant, and he sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you just heard has been fulfilled this very day. And everyone spoke well of him and was amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips. How can this be, they asked. Isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this the carpenter's son? This is a serious declaration that Jesus is making, a, a messianic declaration. And the people who have waited so long for their Messiah are glad to hear it. But then, rather than leaving well enough alone, Jesus, he takes it a step too far. And he begins to speak about the Gentiles and God's, God's heart for them, God's place for them in his plan. And at this point, the people are enraged. They can't believe what they're hearing. And, and here's how serious their hatred of people outside their ethnic group was, of, of Gentile people, and how deep their antagonism to the idea that God might care about them. Look at verse 28. When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. Jumping up, they mobbed him and forced him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built. They intended to push him over the cliff. They were going to kill him for daring to think that God might have a place in his heart and in his plan for the Gentile people. But he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. Now obviously there's something in their hearts, in their minds, in their culture that needs to be confronted. Something that God wants to do here that Jesus would like to do. And the question is, how does he go about confronting them on this issue? What does he do with this? Look at Matthew, chapter 15. What he does might, uh, might surprise you. Matthew 15. Verse 15 says, Then Peter, who is one of Jesus' followers, one of his disciples, he said to Jesus, Explain to us the parable, or that story that you told, that says that people aren't defiled by what they eat. Now that, that was news to somebody from that Old Testament culture, which had all kinds of rules about what you could eat, what you could touch. And Jesus was basically saying, it's not what you eat that defiles you. And Jesus answers, he says, don't you understand yet, Jesus asked. Anything you eat passes through the stomach and then goes into the sewer. But the words you speak come from the heart. That's what defiles you. From the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, slander. These are what defile you. Eating with unwashed hands will never defile you. I mean, you may get sick, but it's not going to impact your relationship with God. What defiles you is what's in your heart. Now, immediately after he says this, here's an interesting story that comes. And as you read the Gospels, often,